Hi everybody, I'm Janet Ingle, the Five Minute Read Maker, and I'm going to talk today um, not immediately about reads, but about endurance as it applies to playing the oboe. Um, lots and lots of people struggle with uh, endurance. Um, it's easy to play the oboe for a minute, but it's hard to play the oboe for much longer than that. And there's a lot of things of uh, factors at play, right? Our little embouchure muscles get very fatigued very, very fast, but also our physical bodies get really um, tense and tight and exhausted very fast. And um, endurance is such a common complaint that I hear from people like, oh, I would love to play the oboe more, but I just can't practice for more than the, the, the an amount of time. Um, I start to play all the way through a movement and I get exhausted super fast. Uh, I just feel like a failure because I can't play for more than 20 minutes. Um, and all of this is really, really normal. It actually is very physically strenuous to play the oboe. Um, so the, the first thing though that I think about for oboists um, regarding endurance is not actually the uh, sort of brute force practicing for endurance that you might expect me to say. Um, the first thing I like to have people focus on is efficiency. And you think about it this way, right? If you go to uh, the pool to swim and you want to swim like a down and back, you want to swim one lap of the pool or you want to swim a hundred yards twice down and back and you get in the pool and immediately you begin like wildly flailing around with all of your arms and legs thrashing. Well, you know, you'll get to the end of the pool, you'll be exhausted and you'll make it back. <laughs> um, but it, it's exhausting. Like already I'm a little short of breath just having done that. Um, and you can imagine that if you go to the pool every single day and you flail wildly around in the water, eventually your body will get used to doing that and you will become able to do your hundred yards back and forth um, with your wildly flailing strokes because that is endurance in a way. You've built up your cardiovascular capabilities to where you can like keep swimming. Um, but a much, much easier and faster path to being able to swim that 100 yards comfortably is to swim like a normal person with an efficient stroke that like doesn't use excess energy and moves the water or moves your body through the water as efficiently as possible. If you're swimming with a, a tidy stroke that doesn't expend all of your energy, um, you can actually get down and back before you even get tired. And that's what I would like you to think about as an oboist, too. Um, I showed up on a Facebook Live recently um, pointing out that as I came back to the oboe after a little bit of a break, um, the first thing that I noticed was that I was uh, holding a lot of tension right in here and sort of in my triceps, weirdly. Um, and as I played, I would stop not because my tiny embouchure muscles were exhausted and not because I was out of breath, but simply because I felt too tight and uncomfortable and in pain in my body. And that's nonsense. Like none of these muscles are actually required for playing the oboe. So working through that, I took some breaths and calmed my body down. I began to play. And as soon as I felt that tension creeping in, I intentionally, relaxed it again and just came back to using my body in a normal way and not holding excess tension in places where it was not useful for my oboe playing. And that was an immediate help to me and hopefully to you. Um, so physical uh, tension and energy, moderating it and keeping things efficient. I'm not a fan, as you know, of standing completely still to play the oboe, but if you find yourself doing this kind of thing or this kind of thing or having like needless uh, extra activity, maybe try chilling that out because it will increase your efficiency and therefore your endurance. Now, another thing that I want to, that I, I see a lot is people who are managing their air really poorly. And you think that air and endurance are gonna be two separate things, but, but the amount of oxygen in your body and the efficiency with which you can use it is a very relevant matter here. So whether you're um, a suffocator, one of those people who takes an enormous breath and then begins to play, 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 and then takes more breaths and you find yourself, excuse me, 
you find yourself with your lungs all full of oxygen, but it's, sorry, with your lungs all full of air, but it's bad air because the air inside your body has turned to carbon dioxide and you find yourself frantic for, desperate for actual air, but as you gasp for more air, you're just stacking it, the good air on top of the bad air, where you can't use it. Um, and then you get to the end of a phrase and you have to explode outward. Um, I believe that that kind of uh, stacking up of bad air and explosive exhaling is not helping your endurance. It is making your body tense and it is keeping you from being able to just use your air in a normal way like a normal human being. And so while playing the oboe is a heightened use of your air, right? It is not exactly like just having a conversation with a friend a few feet away. Um, but I really like as much as possible to feel like my air is as conversational as possible. Um, I talk all the time with my students about like, what if you, what if to begin to play the oboe, you didn't have to go <sighs> because you would never talk to a friend like that. <sighs> Hi, how are you? Happy New Year. How was your weekend? What have you been up to? Right. It's, it's unreasonable to um, communicate in that way. And what is playing the oboe if not communication? So I would submit to you that taking smaller breaths, that allowing your air to feel a little bit more conversational, as opposed to might be a better solution. Um, and going along with that, I really like to keep my air maintained lower in my body, um, lower in my lungs, um, at, you know, a third to a half a tank at most as I'm playing, because I find it easier then to exhale, inhale, um, and keep my air managed in a way that is comfortable physically in my body. So, um, I will mark places in my music to exhale. Almost any time I see an actual printed rest in the music, um, I will use that time to get rid of air um, and then breathe in only enough to get me to my next breath mark. Um, yes, of course, playing the oboe is more heightened than having a quiet conversation with a friend, but I can produce that by uh, pressurizing it more, by supporting it more, by blowing harder. Um, and still I can keep my eye on, like, where is my next breath? Do I need to take this much air to get there? Almost certainly not. Um, so I try to maintain all of my air low and comfortable in my body so that it's easy for me to take a new breath the next time I need one. Um, and having access to good and comfortable air in a way that is comfortable in my body is huge for me in terms of endurance. Going right along with that, I like to think about the concept of micro rests as I'm working through a piece of music. Even if the piece of music is written continuously with no actual printed rests, like, you know, the Strauss Concerto first two pages or any number of other works, um, it is not true that your approach to the piece has to be one of continual sustained effort. Um, the music flows in phrases just like sentences and paragraphs um, within a book. It can be a very long book, but there are plenty of commas and periods in it where the narrator would take a natural breath. Um, so too on the oboe. If I look at places where the phrase ends, even if I don't choose to breathe at every one of those places, I can treat a phrase ending as a place of rest where I'm not pushing so hard, where I'm allowing the music to rest, where I lift just the littlest bit. Even if I'm not breathing, maybe I'm not producing sound so actively. Maybe I'm not working so hard. And working my way in a, in a piece of music that is heavy and has few rests in it, working my way from micro rest to micro rest, finding those places where I don't have to be pushing so hard is for me a huge part of thinking about endurance. Okay, uh, finally, um, I do uh, think about the little muscles of my embouchure, right? That's really, really important because they are the things that fatigue so very fast. And 
here again, I would like to bring your attention to the concept of efficiency. How much work are you doing with those little tiny muscles? And is it possible that you could do less work? For me, this is where having a really stable read is very important. I make my reads as stable as possible so that instead of having to go mm, to play things in tune, I can basically just go I want my read to be fairly closed um, so that my approach to it can be one of openness. And I want my read to basically take care of its own pitch. Um, a really handy way to take a look, to see what your read wants to do um, is sometimes I will take my read and I will play it right out of the corner of my mouth where I have no actual embouchure muscles. And I'll just sort of see what happens when I do that. And hopefully my read holds itself in tune pretty well up and down the oboe. You hear that it's just a little bit flat in the upper register. That's not ideal for me. I would like it to hold itself up. Um, but basically for the most part, if I put good air behind this reed, even if I'm doing nothing, if I, all I'm doing is sealing my lips around the reed. Right, with the exception of those upper octaves, which again, this is not my most ideal read. Um, it's basically taking care of itself and it's playing surprisingly well. Um, so when I come back to the front, I know that all I actually need to do is roll in a little bit for those upper notes, support them a little bit or clip my read, which is also an option. But I really don't have to do very much because I've built the read to be stable, to take care of its own basic core sound and pitch so that I can do less. Um, and that, that is the key, I think, to good endurance. Like, let's let it be as easy as possible for your physical body. Let's let the oboe and the reed take care of things as much as possible. And I believe that given uh, good air and a moderately stable reed, the oboe wants to play in tune. It does not require of you all of this fussing that some people do that really does wear you out really fast. I think that nothing exhausts me faster than a flat read, even if I don't really quite even register that it's flat. Um, you know, it could be right at 440, maybe just the hair is a bit below 440, and that feels very satisfying to me as I give an A, right? Because I'm like, ooh, this is a read that I can really blow into comfortably and safely. But no, a read that is sitting under pitch for me is a read that I have to constantly adjust and bring up. And at first, I'll be doing that with the tiny muscles of my embouchure. But as, as they fatigue and I get more and more tired, I'll start transitioning that activity to the big muscles of my jaw. And suddenly, I am biting. And biting is exhausting, right? And doesn't sound good and makes it really hard to do actual nuances. Um, the kinds of nuances that I would normally do, uh, that I would normally manage with the little muscles of my embouchure. And so the more I have to bite, the less good my endurance is. Um, so those I think are really the most important elements of how to have better endurance. Um, try to not hold unnecessary tension in your body or have unnecessary motion in your body. Try to keep your air managed so that you as a human being are comfortable and able to like utilize all the oxygen that's in your lungs and have the most stable reed and most well-adjusted oboe possible so that you can do less about it. Um, the read thing, right, is a factor for everybody. And I would like to share that I'm going to do uh, some free live read making next week. Next week? I think I'm going to do it on the 12th, 13th, 14th of January. And I'm going to drop a link to sign in to sign up for that because I'll have some handouts that will go along with it. Um, 
because of course at the end of this month I am going to be offering my beginning Readmaker course again, Zero to Readmaker, um, in which I really do try to work through all of the steps um, of how to make a stable, competent, playing read without a lot of angst and um, without having to be neurotic about it, uh, without having to be panicky about it. Um, so that is a thing that I am doing and a thing that I am offering. And uh, the the free aspect of it is going to be some re live read making on Facebook so that you can show up, watch what I'm doing, ask me questions in the comments um, and have a little conversation about that. And that will be coming up in a couple of weeks. I have a link for you right here. And thank you so much for watching. Um, how do you think about endurance? Is there anything in your arsenal of, of tips and tricks and tactics that is different from anything I've talked about here. Do you have articles of disagreement with me? Let me know in the comments. I love to hear from you. Um, of course, if you need to reach out to me other than via this video, you can find me at JennaDingle.com. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.